Hey, good morning, church. Let's go and stand and worship our God today. Come on. Here in your light we find what makes us come alive, a sacrifice of praise. A city on a hill, surrender to your will, your glory on display. Come on. Your glory on display. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. Love a force of grace, consuming every space, it's uncontainable. You're coming like a flood, our hearts are filling up, all things are possible. Come on, sing it like you mean it. All things are possible. Awesome in this place, Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. You will be praised. Sing your praise goes on. Your praise goes on and on forevermore. We lift the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come is what we're living for. We lift the name of Jesus. Your praise goes on and on forevermore. We lift the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come is what we're living for. We lift the name of Jesus. Come on, sing awesome in this place. Awesome in this place, Jesus, you are awesome in this place. And worthy to be praised, Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. You will be praised. Come is what we're living for. 
week about what's happening in this place and what's happening within the body of Christ. The church is entering into a season where it's time that we start producing elite warriors, that we start producing statement, statesmen. We start producing heroes. Now they will be mighty men and women of God, no longer considered laymen. Are you hearing me? Mighty men and women of God, not laymen any longer. It's time we've got forward momentum and we're, it's time that we feed it. The five-fold ministry is being released into the body of Christ. The body of Christ is now going to have a voice. This body of Christ will define the culture. Culture will no longer define us. Oh, come on, somebody shout. It's time that believers become the ecclesia. Say it, I'm the ecclesia. Amen. Well, welcome to New Hope. Amen. We're so glad that you're here. I'm the ecclesia, babe. <laughs> Good Good morning. I'm so glad to see everybody here this morning. And you know it's not an accident. Like, this is a divine appointment for each and every one of us. God has a word for us this morning. This is just like a drop of it. This is just a taste of what God has for us this morning. So let's just submit our hearts and our just our whole countenance to him and say thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in us today, whether it's worshiping or whether it's just sitting and soaking in the word that God has given and anointed um, and chosen my incredible husband to deliver this morning. So, okay, sorry. <laughs> I do, I have to admit, I am a little prejudiced, but um, good morning, welcome to our visitors. Do we have any visitors this morning? And if we do, will you please just, um, raise your hand and let us know you're here. When you came in, you received a bulletin, and in the bulletin is a connect card. It looks like this. 
And if you'll fill that out and either put it in the offering today, oh yeah, and if you didn't get a bulletin, we have um, our ushers coming down and they can give that to you. Welcome, welcome. Let's give them a hand. Let's just welcome them. In. Such a blessing you've chosen us to worship with this morning, the New Hope family. But if you will just fill that out and either put in the offering later or there is offering receptacles back in the foyer or out in the commons back over here. And right after service, if you're a first time visitor, because we like to recognize if you're here one, two, or even three times, we have gifts for every time you come. So please don't go unrecognized. But if it's your first time, please go to the information center, which is right behind that wall, and we have a coffee mug for you. And I know they have kind of poked fun at me, but that coffee mug it, tomorrow morning could be an incredible reminder of what God did in your heart today, how he changed the way you've chosen to live life. So get your coffee mug, go to our coffee house and get a free specialty coffee, and just enjoy the rest of the day. Maybe. Not I, I thought she was going to just preach today. I was just going to go sit down. We are so glad that you're here. Take a few minutes. Uh, greet about a thousand people around you. Let somebody know you are that you are so happy that they're here. Hey, meet somebody new this morning. Amen. God bless you. And hey, we want to welcome those of you that are on Facebook this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Man, God's got a word for you, and we want you to be a part of it. Just don't sit there and be a, a spectator, but join in. Sit there. Get your notepad out. Take notes, because God's got something for you. We want you to be a part of what God's doing. Let us let me pray for you right now. Father, we thank you so much for everyone that's online watching this service. We want them to know that they're a part of this body as well. Father, speak to them, minister to their hearts, minister to them strongly so that they'll receive what you have for them today. Father, we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We look forward to you being with us for the rest of the service. God bless you. We'll see you in just a few minutes. Why don't you come on, come on in and have a seat. I, I blew the whole program here. Come on and take a seat. We want you to take a list, look at uh, the video announcement so you know what's going on this week. So stop talking. Stop fellowshipping. <laughs> we want you to know what's going on. So take a look at this. Listen up parents, this is for you. Are you in need of a night out? Join us September 28th from 6 to 9 p.m. for our parents' night out. We invite you to bring your kids through age 10 to the church where they can be cared for by our awesome Kids Connect team. You are able to sign up for this fun night in the commons, the lobby, and on the fourth floor. 
Oh yes, it's ladies' night and the beer it's right. Oh yes, it's ladies' night. Oh what a night. Ladies, oh what a night it's going to be. Join us Tuesday, October the 2nd here at MGT New Hope. We are continuing our session on She Is. So you know what, ladies? Be here because it's ladies' night. Good morning, church. I am here to get you in the know with what is happening with Paradigm Youth. So we took a break from meeting uh, on Wednesdays during the summer, but we are bringing Wednesdays back with a bunch by meeting the first Wednesday of the month, only the first Wednesday of the month. These nights are gonna be jam-packed with guest speakers, with fun, with games, with food, with giveaways. So make sure you are there. If you are a student, make sure you are there and bring some friends. If you are a parent of the student, Kick them out of the house. Turn off the Xbox, turn off the PlayStation, and get them out of the house. This will be a night that will change their lives. And if once a month is not enough for you, we have weekly meetings for your students, um, for guys and separately for the girls. Every week those meetings are happening. And then every Sunday, you can join us for worship in the main sanctuary and then Paradigm Cafe straight after that. If you have any questions, you can contact me through my email, or you can contact me through the church office. Hi, I'm Pastor Scott Reese from MGT New Hope, and what a delight and what an honor it is this year to host the Night to Honor Israel right here at the Quad Cities. I have a passion and a heart for the nation of Israel and for the people of Israel. In fact, in just a few months, we're gonna be taking our fourth trip to Israel as we celebrate what God is doing in that amazing place. I'm delighted to live in a city and in a community that gives honor and, and knows how to honor what the Lord is doing in the Quad Cities relative to Israel. It's gonna be an amazing night. I've carried a passion for Israel in my heart for a long time and have prayed with, with prophets like Dutch Sheets and Chuck Pierce and, and Lou Engle and men that know what it is to invest into this place that God is so special to his heart. So I want you to join us this year in a very special night when we celebrate all that God is doing in Israel and what God is doing on behalf of Israel right here in the Quad Cities. I'll see you then. This is my husband Kent and I'm Jennifer uh, Kent and Jennifer West and um, one of the one of the areas that we serve in this in this body is through um, community churches and so we are community pastors and we meet on Tuesdays um, from the, the second and the fourth Tuesday of every month and one of the things that community churches is to us is it's a it's a smaller um, gathering of um, the body of Christ getting together and just to um, worship with one another to get to know one another on an, on another level and on a, a, a greater depth and to be able to celebrate and um, each other's lives and enjoy each other um, so there's plenty of community churches that are taking place out of this congregation and Kent and I will be out in the um, information desk. And if you have any questions about those and you want to know more about them or where they're at or where they're located or who they are, just let us know and we'll be able to answer those questions. So, um, well, it's really an honor and a privilege to um, be up here and um, receive a, the offering today. Um, it's not my most favorite thing to get up on stage and talk in front of people, but not because I don't love people, but because I just... I, I prefer more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. <laughs> so just hang in there with me and I'm just trying to be a little real about it because I think that that's this time of, this time of the service um, offering is another time that we can just worship the Lord and it's from a heart attitude that that comes from. And so um, I just am encouraging you to, wherever you're at in your, um, finances or in the areas that 
you're looking for to see God's prosperity on your life. It could be lots of lots of things, relationships, um, you know, uh, financially. Um, but if you're if you're in a place where those areas are a, a struggle for you today, I just want to encourage you that um, God is good, and He came to bring life and life more abundant, and um, it may look one way, and the enemy has come to tell us something different, but that um, the Lord is really good, and his plans are to prosper us in every way, and he's come to bring life and life more abundantly. So I just declare that over this body and over our lives. And um, I, I know Kent has something he wants to share, but um, thanks for the opportunity to come up here and just share in this time with you and worship with you in, in offering. Amen. And we have uh, text to give right here. And so um, if you, um, you can do text to give. I don't mind getting up in front of people. Once I get the mic, I'm, I'm good. Um, so, uh, but we have text to give right here. And Jennifer actually gets those. I don't know if you know it, but she's the uh, office manager downstairs. So, um, sort of. And then, uh, or the money girl, I don't know. She gets paid every two weeks, that's what I'm interested in. And, uh, cause it's giving time. Uh, it, yeah, this isn't how it was gonna go. Um, and then otherwise there's envelopes in front. And so, I think Jennifer and I talked about it and she kinda shared what's on our heart. Like this, this is our seed, we're up here just simply to lead you in worship in giving. So that, that's all we want to do is wherever your heart is, whatever your need is, you know, personally, I've gone through roller coasters of what tithing is about. Do I have to? Do I, you know, it's whatever your heart is, the church, we tithe personally because we sow a seed and we give honor to the Lord. What he's given us, we give to him. And it's never let us down, not, not once. I've got stories. Um, I was going to share one, but I think we're, I'll, I'll save it. So if you want to, because I'll be back. Um, <laughs> may, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I, I'm, I'm avoiding Kenny to make sure I can come back. Um, so um, 2 Corinthians 9.8, though, says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. I take that at face value. The Lord has made me rich, and I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about family, and ministry, and health, you know. I was able to, you know, here we are. And so, just join me and Jennifer in, in this giving, wherever your um, needs are. Just take it to the Lord right now. And so, Father, we just come before you, and I thank you, Father, for the opportunity to worship you and to sow these seeds so that we can further your kingdom. And so, Father, I ask you, as, as Kenny said, our culture will shape this area. And so I thank you, Father, that these seeds go out into the nations and further your kingdom. Amen.
You say amen when you don't have, don't know what else to say. So it's amen. <laughs> this is uh, this is the week of the month that we receive our missions offering. So uh, don't put your wallets away. Don't put those checkbooks away, because there are missionaries on the field that we support that need support. And uh, so I was talking with Michelle, and she said, you know, we used to uh, show uh, like a video highlight of our missionaries, and so. Uh, she told me that like on Thursday, so I had to get a missionary to send us a video. So the closest one I knew was the missionaries we support in South Africa, my children. <laughs> so it was easy to call them and say, uh, hey, I need a video and you need to do it now for them to do it. And so they put together a little video to greet you. So uh, take a look at this, our missionaries in Africa. Hey, this is the Steiner family, and we are here in South Africa. Just wanted to give you guys a quick update, and first of all, just thank you so much, man. Your support, your encouragement, and really your church. Like, your church has done a phenomenal job of really rallying behind a family of missionaries and letting us be the hands and feet of Jesus. I had a wonderful opportunity of going out last week and even talking with some guys in squatter camps and ministering to them and really get to lay hands and heal them actually of one of their sicknesses. And so it was just a really cool opportunity of really going shack to shack and getting to know people's story. But the only reason that we can do that is because of people like you, a church, a giving church could really get behind a family like us and allow us to literally be the hands and feet of Jesus everywhere we go. And so we just want to say thank you from the bottom of our heart and really Thank you for getting behind us. So again, we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus here because of you, but now you get to be the hands and feet of Jesus where you are. So go ahead, spread the good news all the way back there in Moline, Illinois. Yeah, and we are so excited to see you guys. We'll be there in just a couple months. So, so excited to see you in person. Um, just can't wait to come I'll share some meals and just be with the church family. So we can't wait to see you guys in a, just a couple months. What do you guys want to say? Do you want to tell them? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, whole family. Now, isn't that the best look of missionaries you ever did see? And uh, they are not only did that video, they're watching on Facebook right now in South Africa. Hey, boys, Papa loves you. Can't wait to see you. Uh, didn't they do a great job? Uh, sit there. Uh, I don't know. They must take after their Gigi with all their talent on stage. I don't know. So we want uh, we want you to give. And here's the thing: we are committed. Um, we we are committed as a body to uh, our missionaries. To the we support about two thousand dollars a month, Jennifer. About two thousand dollars a month to missionaries. And we're not just you know send in twenty five dollars to this person, five dollars to this group. When we say support them, we support them. And so uh, we do that because you generously give. And, uh, and as, as my son-in-law said, you get, to be the you get to be the hands and feet right now to help missionaries stay on the field. And uh, so I want you to pray. And as we pray, I just want you to ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to give today for our missionaries? And, and I know it'll be enough because I know the Father is interested in discipling nations. And I know that's what they're doing in South Africa. So, Father, thank you so much of what you're doing in the hearts of people all over this world. And for those that are in South Africa, as I know my son-in-law and my grandsons, my grandboys, and my daughter go out into the squatter camps and go shack to shack and hearing people's stories and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And they're only able to do that, to stay on that field as we here in America support them and give to them. And all the other missionaries that we support all over the world, Father, we pray that you would bless them. You would give them strength. You would not let them get weary in well-doing, but you would give them, supply every need that they have. And we thank you, Father, that as every person comes to know Jesus, those that are healed, we get to be a part of that reward because of our giving. And we thank you, Father, for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. They're going to pass the bucks. As, as the baskets go by, why don't you stand to your feet and let's continue just to worship the Lord together. You stood outside my grave With tears still on your I heard you say my name, my night was turned to day, and you came, and I knew that you would come, you say, 
Continue to worship. I just want to ask the prayer teams to come down front. If you have a need in your heart, we serve a miracle working God. Still today. Those stories aren't just stories, but those are real life situations that God moved in the lives of people, in the in the lives and where they had needs. 
So I encourage you, if you have needs in your life today, come down front. And these people down front will pray with you. We also have personal communion on the sides if you want to join them. when you lose someone, when you uh, are in a financial crisis, when you're in a pivotal moment in your life, to have that kind of unshakable faith to say, you came, I knew you would come. I knew you'd come. I need that unshakable faith today. I don't know if you need that unshakable faith today, but I need that unshakable faith. I knew that you would come, Lord, in the midst of my trials, in the midst of my healing, in the midst of my chaos, I knew you would come. So I know the prayer partners are still up here. If you need some unshakable faith in your life, I would take advantage of them being up here and and get prayed for. Say, I need a little more faith in my life. I need to be, if I'm on my deathbed, to know, you know what? He's got me, and I know he's not going to leave me here to rot. 
I know he's not going to abandon me today or ever. I knew that he would come. Thank you, Jesus. We've only scratched the surface and only had just one glimpse. Tasted of your glory, and there's so much more. We're standing on horizons where earth collides with heaven. You're longing for your children.
Take your throne upon our praise Here in this place Have your way The moment that we see you We are changed Show us your glory Show us your glory And wonder and surrender we fall Show us your glory, show us your glory.
unseen why don't you have a seat I think that's just such an, an incredible word because we say show us your mercy show us your grace show us your power show us your glory but then the question is do we have eyes to see? Look in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 9. Get your Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter 9. Or turn your phones on. For those of you that are, are guests with us this morning, guess what? I am not Pastor Scott. Pastor Scott is in Milan at our Milan campus this morning, so I'm, uh, I'm pinch hitting for him in here this morning. Thank you. This, uh, this word that I have for you this morning, the Lord has been working in me for um, several months. Uh, it, was, it was on the airplane when we were on our way to Colorado Springs with Kathy and Pastor Scott and I to, to the Appeal to Heaven conference there with Dutch. And the Lord took me to this passage of Scripture and for the, these several months, God's been birthing this inside of me. Matthew 9, 27. Look at this verse. As Jesus left the house, okay, he's just healed uh, Jairus' daughter, and he's on his way back to Capernaum. Jesus left the house. Two blind men began following him.
Does that puzzle anybody but me? They began shouting over and over, Son of David, show mercy and heal us. Here's a question that I begin to ponder in my heart. How do, how do blind guys follow anything? And then the Lord spoke this to me. They're absent, get this, pay attention. Their, absent of, their absence of sight became an invaluable resource to help them see. That's powerful. Because you know what? So many times in our walk with God, we base it by only what we see with our natural. Maybe sometime we need to shut off our natural eyes so we can see into the unseen. The absence of these two blind guys' sight became an invaluable resource to help them gain sight. We get hindered so easily by the realm in which we can see. We get stumbled up by what we can see with our natural eyes. We struggle with revelation in which we can't see or wrap our brain around to understand. Do you get that? Did you get that? Let me say it again. We struggle with revelation in which we can't see or wrap our brain around so we can understand it. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. This is what the scripture says when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard. Well, brother, I don't know what's going on over there. I can't find that in the Bible. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God wants to do in your life. Amen. Amen. He is an awesome God. Ye so awesome, the Bible says, when he kicked Lucifer and all the angels out of heaven, it was like lightning. It was no big deal to our awesome God. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are bigger than our ways. You can't understand him. You just need to see him. You know what, folks? We've got to try, we've got to stop trying to get God down on our level so we can understand him. You get that? Up there in the balcony, Tim, you get that? Make sure you're paying attention up there. Instead of trying to get God down to our level so we can understand him, how about let's get our faith raised up to a level where God operates? This side over here used to really be shouting. What happened to all your shouting group? That's what I'm talking about. Because here's what's happened. We've had a generation dumb down God because they needed a God that had no requirements. You see, it's good to live life the way you want to live it and say you're a believer and say you love God if you serve a God that has no requirements of you. You'll be thinking, man, Pastor Scott's going to get back here because Pastor Kenny can't preach anymore. Just roll your toes up. You'll be all right. I've been sitting on this word for several months. You see, a generation has dumbed down God so they could serve a God that had no requirements, produces a Christianity with no sacrifice which produces forgiveness without real repentance. We were, we were having lunch yesterday with Stephen Luane, and I told him I was preaching the message to him. I said, you all need to really pray, because 
this could either be blow people's minds away or I'll get fired tomorrow. You see, when you produce a Christianity that has no sacrifice, produces a forgiveness without real repentance, produces Christians that feel they're right with God because they attend a church service. They attend a church service, yet they're still in bondage to sin. They're not set free. Marriages are still a mess. People are still getting a divorce. People are believing that they can serve God with no sacrifice, with no repentance. Which leads us to a wrong, unbiblical definition of grace. Listen to me. Grace is not God turning his face away from your sin and putting his arm around you going, it's okay. You're going to be okay. Grace is God turning his face and dealing with your sin. It's God rolling up his sleeves and saying, I'm coming in there and something's going to die because I love you that much. (laughs) listen to me nobody in this room has gotten free because God turned his face away from what was bonding binding you up what got you free is because Papa God Joshua rolled up his sleeves and he went to battle on your behalf Let me tell you something. That whole thing about justified, justification, is just as if I'd never sinned. Baloney, you sinned. And God paid the price for you. Every time you look at that cross, every time you have an intimate time of devotion with Papa, you see how miserable you were. And because of him rolling up his sleeve, because of him moving into your life, he set you free because of that cross by him giving up his son. It's not just just as if you'd never sinned. You sinned. And he paid the price for you because of his grace. Oh, that's why you can worship. That's why you get crazy when you worship because you see what he saved you from. You see what he delivered you from. You see, without that, it robs you of really the feeling of being forgiven. We have a, we have It would surprise you of how many, if you ask Christians, do you really feel that you've been forgiven? Ah, kind of. Are you kidding? It's because somehow, in some way, they've lost that feeling of conviction and knowing what their sin was and knowing the price that that but that that our God paid by his son on that cross. Papa allows us to see our sin through the cross, and then his grace lets us see the Jesus that hung on the cross, that paid the price for your sin, for my sin. And then I can say, I am free. I am a free man. I am a free man. When that enemy tries to come at me and say, well, what about that sin in your life? I go, hey, wait, wait, wait. Look at the cross. He set me free. You need to talk to that guy. Talk to the guy that's hanging on the cross. Because when he was crucified, so was I crucified. I am a free man. Because Papa rolled up his sleeve and said, I care enough about you. I'm dealing with that sin inside you. That's why the psalmist says, why David said, search me, O God. Roll up your sleeve, Papa, and look at me. I want to be free. I want to see into the unseen. Greater is he that's in me. And when I realize that, I see differently. You start seeing 
Something's happening inside of you. You remember that one guy in the Bible? He denied Jesus several times. One point, Jesus cast, Jesus looked at him and said, Satan, get behind me. Until all of a sudden something happens, he starts seeing different. All of a sudden now he's covered with something different. And now his shadow is walking past people and healing them. We're going into something that's bigger than us and that's setting over top of us. We're coming into something so big and we're seeing it. We're beginning to see it not with our natural eyes. We're seeing it with our spiritual eyes. Like Peter, like Paul. It's setting over us and it's going to start it's going to start to affect the culture that you live in because your your shadow now has something bigger over it than just you and by what you see. Come on church. It's not because we've gotten smarter but because of what's over us is so profound, you're getting more boldness. You're getting more courage. You're getting set free. You're getting more breakthrough than you've ever had because of what that spirit is setting over you by what you see in the spirit realm. Get out of your natural sight. Start seeing like those two blind men. Two blind men in this story couldn't see Jesus naturally. Perhaps they were actually operating in a higher realm of perception. Think about it. There's something in these blind guys that their spirit saw. Something that was leading them to follow. Something that was in them crying out, Son of David. They were drawn by the presence of that their spirit recognized rather than judging what their eyes could see. Could it be, listen, could it be that our sight is negatively affecting our vision? Can we say that again? Because that's good. Could it be that our sight is negatively affecting our vision? It's our sight into the unseen. It's our sight into the seen affecting our sight into the unseen. Can you see revival? Can you see a culture changing? You can't see it with your natural eyes. Sometimes we just need to decide to make what we see bow to a greater reality of what we see in the unseen, even if we don't totally understand it. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't understand that. So? There is a realm greater than what we are seeing. And I'm, it, what I'm seeing, that's allowing my vision talk to me and set my course. It's the unseen that's the reality. And that's what I'm using to set my course. Not but what I see. Let's start seeing things like they really are. You see, seeing is determined by how I rearrange my life in connection with Jesus. I mean, two thieves hanging on the cross. Remember that story? One thief railed and mocked Jesus. The other one looked through Jesus to the other one and said, man, don't you fear God? How does two people with the exact same position see things totally different? One saw him to mock him. One saw him to surrender himself to. One had vision. One had just sight. Listen, all the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, 
They could not see him. But two blind guys saw him. Rabbis that studied what he was going to be like, missed seeing what he was like. Priests could not see him, but a prostitute could. Scholars could not see him, but a leopard could. The woman caught in adultery, she could see him. The woman at the well, she could see him. The Roman leader could see him. You see, seeing, folks, is about intimacy. Seeing is about intimacy. All the stuff we think we know often robs us of the raw reality that he doesn't want us necessarily to understand his systems or understand his world. He wants us to recognize his face. You don't have to figure God out. Just see his face. He's not wanting someone to to know all of the theological discourses of the entire Bible. He just wants you to know his heart. He wants you to have opportunity to come into a place of being intimate with him. Remember when the Pharisees in Matthew, they asked Jesus for a sign. He said, you can look at the sky and see what color it is to determine what the weather's going to be like tomorrow, but you can't look at my face and see that I'm the one you've been waiting for. You understand, he's saying you understand religion so much, you understand church, you know how the thing works, but you don't recognize me. All they're seeing was in their natural. I'm telling you, when you start seeing, it's going to mess up how you've done things in the past. Think about it. If the way that we've been doing church for the past hundred years changed the world, then why do we see statistics like this? These are Christians, U.S. Christians. Eighty percent of men in church look at pornography on a daily basis. I don't know about you, but that breaks my heart. Eighty percent of men in church look at pornography on a regular basis, and call themselves, man, I love God. If we've been doing church right for the last hundred years, why do one in three teenagers, one in three, thinks it's wrong to look at pornography? One in three. Only 37% of Christians believe in the literal meaning of the Bible. 91% of Christians believe the best way to find yourself is by looking within yourself. 86% of Christians believe to be fulfilled in your life, you should pursue the things you desire. What's the Bible say? Your heart is desperately wicked. Guard your heart because out of it comes the issues of life. And 86 Christians believe to be fulfilled, you should pursue the things you desire. What does your heart, what does your heart outside of seeing and being intimate with Jesus want to pursue? Sin. Why do we see 79% of Christians, people, Christian people believe you can believe whatever you want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. 
69% of Christians believe any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. This is Christians. Four out of 10 Christians are sympathetic to some Muslim teachings. 53% of Christians, no, 43% of Christians believe abortions should be illegal. 53% of Christians believe abortions should be legal. If we've been doing, if we've been doing it right for the last hundred years with all of the whatever and how we've ever done it, why are we still seeing to stick statistics like this? Because uh, Listen, last night when I was working and the day before and working and, and looking and trying to see what the state of Christianity is like in, in, in the U.S., I found and I, I did a survey, how many abortions has there been since Roe v. Wade, 1973? Luana, have you seen this clock? It's an, it's, it's, um. Abortionclock.org. It's a clock that's ticking down worldwide, U.S., since today, since Roe v. Wade. At 4 o'clock yesterday, here's the number. And remember, 53% of Christians believe it's, it's okay. 60,724,716. That's just surgical abortions have taken place in the United States since Roe v. Wade in 1973. That was at 4 o'clock yesterday. Right before I came upstairs to start the service, the number grew, 60,762,600. You see, success can only be measured. Success in church, success in the body, success can only be measured by his presence that's changing culture. Two blind guys had a revelation of seeing Jesus. They called him son of David. You can't pass over that. They were not calling him teacher. These blind guys that got up to follow him called him Messiah. Chronologically, listen, chronologically, outside of the wise men at the birth of Jesus, these two blind guys were the only guys to recognize him as Jesus the Messiah. Two blind guys. It took two blind men to come to the scene to say, you're not just a good teacher. You're not just a prophet. You haven't done just extraordinary miracles. You are the Messiah. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25, Jesus prays, thank you. Father, thank you for you are Lord, supreme ruler over heaven and earth. You have hidden the great revelation of your authority from those who are proud and wise in their own eyes. Instead, you have shared it with those who humble themselves. We can't any longer, folks, settle for what we're just seeing. We've got to start Allowing what we see in this book to ruin our lives. I've been in ministry 40 years. And in the last few years, this book is ruining me all over again. It's ruining me because now I've started to see. And I don't just judge what's going on in my natural sight around me, but I'm at the point, if I see it, I believe it. This is the truth. This is the word of God. This is what sets our course. I want the stuff that I has not seen nor ear heard. How about you? 
We were created to see Jesus. But listen, the only way you'll find him, while he may be found, is through proximal, intimate obsession. Proximal, intimate devotion, obsession of being intimate with the Father. You see, when our intimate devotion changes, our seeing changes. And when our seeing changes, our schedule changes. Family importance changes. Those things that we have found in our lives that were more important than our relationship with God or our intimate devotions with God now changes because now something in our sight changes and our sight now becomes, I've got to be intimate with the Father. Everything else has got to stop. I've got to go be alone with Jesus. I've got to go have time with the Father. I've got to sit in his presence. I've got to have his word in my life. You see, when you want to see, there has to be an obsession with an intimacy with the Father. It can't be any longer blessing the food. It's got to be a time when you go into your prayer closet and you don't come out until you've had intimate relationship with the Father. You're seeing changes. I was praying over in the green room one afternoon And I was praying about this, and, and, I, and I've battled, and every family battles with the importance of things that's going on in a family, and this, and this, and this, and this, and that. We battled it in our own family. And then you go, go, go off on vacation, and you know, <laughs> I had, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit put this in my thought. What if the presence of God gets so real and so strong in this house? The people from all around start taking vacation to go to Moline, Illinois, so they can be here to see the presence of God. That just all of a sudden becomes the the vacation spot. Instead of, you know, we're not going on a cruise. We're not going to Caribbean. Babe, I feel like we're supposed to go to Moline, Illinois. Well, what's there? I don't know. But I know the presence of God there because there's people there that have been intimately obsessed with the possession of intimacy with the Father. They started seeing something, and I want to be a part of that. We've heard people come up to Pastor Scott and say, I I don't know what's going on there, but I can't stay away. Why? Because people are starting to see. People are starting to see. God's looking for a people with a desire to shut themselves up with him. People are saying all the time, I don't know why I'm coming there, but I'm coming. Because something's happening, people are seeing. Hunger, folks. Your hunger has to change to want more. To want more. To want more. Say, man, I've made the the dedication. I'm getting up an hour early before I go to work because I want to go into my prayer closet and just spend time with the Father. And your hunger is going to grow so much that it's going to be two hours early because you don't want to leave. You don't want to leave his presence. He's going to start showing you things in the word because you start to see that all of a sudden now the word is to be, oh, oh, I obey the word because there's no other option. And we have a hunger to come into his presence and know him and be intimate with him. Hosea chapter 4. Oh, Hosea chapter 4. In verse 6, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. Since you priests refuse to know me, I refuse to recognize you as my priests. Since you have forgotten the laws of your God, I will forget to bless your children. Listen, get that. That's important. 
People are not being destroyed before a lack of intellectual inheritance of understanding. Did you get it? People are not being destroyed for a lack of intellectual inheritance or understanding. We have a lack of intimacy, not information. There's no way that someone that's intimate with the Father can be a part of that st- statistic that says 53% of Christ- Christians believe abortion should be legal. If you're intimate, being intimate with the Father, you'll never be a part of that statistic. That statist- that says, if you want to really enjoy life, look inside. Unless you're looking inside this book. Hosea Hosea is saying, they know a lot. They just don't know me. Could it be, oh listen, get this. Could it be that if we are seeing, that if what we are seeing is keeping us from seeing what we were meant to see, then knowing what we know is keeping us from knowing what we were meant to know. Again, Kathy's going, again, again. See, and I'm just in my quiet time, and and the Lord says this to me, and I just start writing it down. Could it be that if what we are seeing, seeing, is keeping us from seeing what we were meant to see, then knowing what we know is keeping us from knowing what we were meant to know? Thank you. You know what? 40 years of ministry, a doctorate, I read the word these days like I got saved yesterday. Something's happened with my seeing. All of a sudden, I start seeing just simple stories, and I begin like two blind men follow Jesus. I've got to the point where I just go to the Lord and say, in my, and when I pray, Lord, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. All the theology, theology that I know, I don't know nothing. I just want to know you. I just want to see you. I just want to be intimate with you. I don't want what I know to keep me from knowing what I'm meant to know. That's good preaching. I don't care who you are. (laughs) God's calling his church to no longer just know about him, but to say, I see him. There he is. We come into a service and we begin to worship because we're seeing. You say, I see him. I see him. These blind men could see much better than we thought. These blind guys saw better than most of us see, even me. But I'm crying out for more. I'm begging my papa for more. Why do children see better than adults? Ever notice children... They see much better than adults because their vision doesn't have to come through a filter of years of of cynicism. They're not looking through lens of doubt or unbelief or disappointment. They just see. They have childlike faith that says, I can't see. What I can't see is more real than what I can see. Listen to this verse, and this is where... This is where Papa's taken me now. Matthew 18, verse 2. Jesus called a little one to his side and said to them, 
Learn this well. He calls a child to himself and says, learn this well. What I'm about to tell you, Jesus says, you learn this. This is critical. Unless you dramatically change the way you're thinking and become teachable and learn about heaven's kingdom realm, right here is what I'm, where I'm going. With the wide-eyed wonder of a child, you will never be able to enter into it. Into what? The kingdom. See, I believe when we begin to see what Papa wants to do is he wants to create in us that childlike faith once again. To get rid of all that hurt and all that cynicism and all that filters and all that stuff and come to the Father with an, like, the wide-eyed wonder of a child. Because they, that wide-eyed wonder of a child, they'll believe whatever you tell them. They'll go wherever you want them to go. They'll jump without even thinking about where they're jumping. They see. I want and I pray for my heart to have a heart of a wide-eyed wonder of a child. Matthew verse 9 and verse 28 says that they followed him right into the house. Have you ever heard that, that saying, God wants to get you out of your comfort zone? God doesn't want you get, God does not want to get you out of your comfort zone. His name, his name is Comforter. God wants you to get you out of the lie that you're comfortable. God wants to take the Holy Ghost and begin prodding you and get you out of that place that you think you're comfortable. That the enemy has lied to you that you're okay, that you are comfortable. There's no comfort in apathy. There's no comfort in, in, in um, non-complacency. There's no comfort in dead religion. Comfort is only found in the obsession of intimacy with the Father. There's where comfort is. The comfort you find is when you get your life into the extreme radical discipleship, extreme intimate devotion, you become kingdom people and become a part of the comforter. More of him, less of me. I think that's your cry every day. Father, more of you, less of me. Life is not the American dream. Life is kingdom living. The kingdom lifestyle is walking in humility and intimate devotion. Kingdom lifestyle is desiring what eye has not seen nor ear has heard. Kingdom lifestyle is obeying the word of God because there's no other option. Jesus walks into the house and two blind men follow him into the house. I don't know, when you get home today, close your eyes and walk into your house. Jesus walks into the house and these two blind guys follow him in. No idea where they're supposed to stop. Basically, these two blind guys are saying, if he's moving, we're moving. Like Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. I'm not moving until he stops talking. Mary's sitting at his feet. Mary's saying, if he wants lunch, he better stop talking because I'm not getting up until he stops talking. More of him, less of me. Do you know when we worship, we're going after that intimacy with the king in our worship? You see people that might dance, might see people that lift their hands. You might see some crazy ones that jump up and down and spin around. 
Let me show, I, the Lord showed me this the other day. He said, you know, the dance, your dance is not something God gives you. It's something you give to God. Sometimes we need to give our flesh a lesson that it doesn't determine how I'm going to worship. My spirit does. Sometimes we just need to tell our flesh, hey, you know what? The the spirit of God is in control here, and I know you flesh, you don't want to dance, but we're dancing anyway because i got to remind you who's in charge, and it's the spirit of God, and I'm going after the king. Someone said, well, you're just in the flesh. We're all in the flesh. (laughs) I'm just getting my flesh in line that it it knows the spirit of God is in control. And I know sometimes my flesh doesn't want to lift its hands, but I'm going to tell it we're doing it anyway because it needs to submit to the spirit of God. Because it's not God giving it to me, I'm giving it to him. You know why? Because he forgave me. Because he saved me. Because he's opening my eyes to see the richness and the fullness of his mercy and his grace. And I see the cross. You see, those that have been forgiven much, worship much. Hard for me to believe you can sit there. You are the great God. Just worship you, Lord. Think about, let your seeing see what he's done for you. And then try to tell me you can't stand still. Because now all of a sudden you're so thankful you're worshiping. You're so thankful for what he's done in your life. You begin, nothing can hold you back. Katie, bar the door. I see and I'm worshiping him. I'm telling you that's good preaching. Those two blind guys decided they were going to follow Jesus instead of assessing boundaries. <laughs> How far is too far? Depends on what you're after. How far is too far for you? Depends on what you're after. That's what they said to, Bar- to, to Barnabas right before he got his eyesight. They were correcting him. Hey, be quiet. Stop your yelling. Jesus said, hey, bring him to me. I hear him. Gave him his eyesight. Sometimes faith sounds like noise to people that don't have a need for it. Those that have been forgiven much, love much, worship much, shout much, thanksgiving much. I didn't know how to phrase that. But here's another question I ask, and I'm, I'm wrapping up. I'd say that like Pastor Scott because I know I got 30 more minutes after he first says that. <laughs> I wonder when the day will come because of our seeing has changed. We stay here all day. We just worship and we just listen to the word. And we don't care what the rest of the schedule's like. Because Papa's here. I want to be where Papa's at. I don't know. I'm in, though. I'm in. Why did Jesus not heal them at the very beginning of the trip? Sure seems like it had made the trip a whole lot easier for those boys. You ever think about that? Do any of you read the word like I do and think, dang, why didn't you heal them right there, Jesus? They'd have been a lot easier on those guys. Did anybody read like that and think two blind guys followed Jesus? How do blind people follow anybody? Here's what I believe and what I believe the Spirit has revealed to me. He was not trying to make it easier or convenient for them. Listen, it's dangerous. It's too dangerous for you to inherit what you've cried out for without process. Listen, 
Listen, he wants you healed more than you want to be healed. He wants you delivered more than you want to be delivered. He wants the salvation of your children and your family more than you do. But he wants you to follow him more. And sometimes you need to just walk in the dust of your rabbi. Sometimes you need to be covered with the dust of your rabbi before the miracle takes place. You see, you all know I've got all kinds of these back issues in my life, and many of you prayed for me. You know what I see? I see I'm healed. I don't see in my natural sight that I have to walk with a cane or or I can't lift one leg up like this. I don't see that. I see in my, my spirit. I see in that sight. I am the healed of God. I just got to get all of this lined up with that. But that's what I see. That's what I declare. Every morning I get up and I anoint myself with oil and I say I am the healed of God and I thank you that you've healed my back. By your stripes I am healed. That's what I see. I believe. I have, many of you probably don't know this, but I have, I don't know, when I played high school football I had 11 concussions. Explains a lot, doesn't it? And I have a tremendous amount of ringing in my ears all the time, 24-7. I mean, my ears ring so bad, you're standing next to me, I'm surprised you don't hear it. And every day I pray because of my sight, because of what the Word says, and I anoint myself. I'm healed. He's healed that ear ringing mess. I'm the healed of God because that's what the Word says. That's the price my Jesus paid for me because my seeing has changed. It doesn't matter what I feel like. It doesn't matter kind of how I have to gimp around. I'm the healed of God. Some of you need to start declaring that over your life. Listen, he wants you to know him. He wants you to see him more than he wants to do anything else in your life. See, we have pressed in after the healer, pressed in for the action, and forgot all about knowing the healer about knowing his. We want to see his hand, but do you know his heart? I want to know his heart. I want to know his heart. One time the Lord, the Papa showed me, the Lord showed me, I was praying, I wanted to know his heart so bad. I've, I know your actions, but Father, I want to know your heart. And the Lord took me through about three days of breaking me, man, breaking me. And I don't know if you've ever been to the part, been broken to the part. If the Father has broken, let me tell you, You put yourself in that place, he will break you. I was at a place, and I would come to the altar, and and Matthew right there, he knows this. He was with me when it was happening. And I'd get to the altar, and all I could do was weep. All I could do was weep before him. I'd come into his presence, all I could do was cry. I couldn't get up. I am crying so bad I couldn't breathe. And finally, he broke me and broke me and broke me and broke me. And he said this, if you want to love, you want to know my heart, you have to love like I love, 1 Corinthians 13. And he showed me, he said, listen, you might think, not think this is grace and mercy of the Father, but listen to what he said. You don't love your wife like 1 Corinthians 13. You don't love your children like 1 Corinthians 13. You only love yourself like 1 Corinthians 13. Let Papa speak that to you. Let Papa begin to reveal to you and open you up and show you who you are. You fall to your face and you'll weep before God and you'll cry out, forgive me. Teach me your ways. Let me see who you are. And you start loving like never before. Because then you can go low. Then you can walk in humility And you can prefer those around you above yourself. And you can take on the characteristic of Jesus because now you see differently. See, Papa wants us to get to the point of when you find that treasure in the field, the pearl of great price that's buried in the field, that you desire it so much You go home and you sell everything and you go back and you buy the field. Intimacy with the Father is selling everything 
and buying the field, of getting into that place of intimacy in your quiet time, in your prayer time, in your worship time, saying, I desire nothing more than the treasure of your presence. That's kingdom people. That's what Pastor Scott's been talking about. Kingdom people, the ecclesia. It's not doing church any longer. It's becoming the authority. It's becoming the ecclesia. It's becoming church. They started seeing. And this is what I feel prophetically. The Lord spoke to me about us. He's waited for a people to have a desire to start seeing in this area, in this region. He's waited for a people to have a desire to start seeing. He's waited for a people that have such a hunger for a, for a people to press in to know their king. He's waited for a people in this time that desire him more than anything, desire him more than fame, desire him more than riches, desire him more than status, career, spouse, desires him more than a home, a nice car, nothing but knowing him. He's waited for that people. He's waited to find the people that will not care about what people think because seeing him is the most important thing in our lives. He's waited for a people to pour himself out to fulfill his dream. His dream, not our dream, his dream. For such a time as this, he's waiting for a people that desire to see him. And then when that people are found, this culture will change. This region will change. This city will change. Because it's God's desires. And his question and his heart for you, do you want to see? Do you want to see? Will you find that place in your heart and in your life, that devotion, intimate, proximal devotion with the Father becomes that pearl of great price that you find, and then you go sell everything to buy that land and to know Him, that the Word becomes not just an option, becomes that thing that ruins our life. It ruins us for status quo. He's waiting. But I believe prophetically what I feel in my heart and what Pastor Scott feels in his heart, that we are that people. We are that people. And that this body and this place has been set for such a time as this to once again start changing culture by not how smart we are, by not how much we know, but our desire to know him more. And those of you that are watching on Facebook, what's your desire? To know him more. I want you to stand to your feet. And I want you to bow your heads. I, I, just, want you to, I just want you to do business with the Lord right now. I want you to judge yourself. Where are you? What is your, what is your level of intimacy with the Father? Is it, an, is it an obsession? Is your life just being judged by what you've seen in the natural, but your heart is that you want to see like those two blind guys? Where are you? You see, it's not my responsibility to put it in you. Because I don't, I can't, I don't want to cheapen it or make it easy. Some of you, God may have to drag through a knot hole. But he loves you so much, he'll do it. He has driven, he has drugged me through knot holes. And I keep asking for more. Because less of me, more of him. Less of me and more of him. You have to do the business with the Father. You have to walk in the dust of your rabbi. What process does he have you through? 
Some of you may just need to say, you know what, Father, so many times the first thing that goes in my day is my quiet time with you. And I need to restore that, Lord. I need to, I need to get back to heaven fellowship with you. Many of you have known him, but you haven't seen him. Don't let that cry of Hosea. You know a lot about me. They, they just can't see me. Do you see him? Just a minute, our prophetic team, prayer team, they're going to come. Some of you need to get down here and have somebody pray for you and have speak a word over you. Some of you need to just come down and say, you know what? God can drag me through every knot hole he wants to drag me through. Because the other side of that knot hole is freedom. Being set free like I've never been set free before. Today is a day of freedom. Today is a day that God sets you free. Restoring wisdom. Restoring a heart to know him. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just pray for this incredible body. Lord, we want to know you so much more. Lord, we want to see our culture changed. We want to see statistics change. We want to see the body of Christ strong. So, Father, right now, put a desire in this congregation, this church that sits in here this morning, a passion and a fire within their belly to know you, to become intimate knowing you so that their eyes can see. Thank you, Father. I feel in my spirit is, I'm going to dismiss just in a second. I just feel in my spirit, the Lord said, there's somebody in here that you need to just get your heart right with him. You kind of, kind of ran your own thing here. He says, I'm, I'm calling you. When you come down, you need to come down to one of these that are praying and say, I, I need to get my heart right with God. I've kind of tried to do it my thing and it's not working. I need to see We love you, Lord, so much. Hold your hands out like this. Father, I pray a blessing over everyone. The blessings of Abraham. I pray mostly, Father, give them eyes to see, ears to hear. We bind every principality that's trying to come and bring destructive power in their life. But we open the Holy Spirit and give you freedom, Holy Spirit, to work in us. Search us, oh God. Find any wicked way in us. We know that you'll be there as we come in a place of repentance, that you'll be there in a place of forgiveness. Man, Lord, I thank you for these people. We pray that, Holy Spirit, you would speak to them powerfully as they leave today. Even when there's so many distractions going on around, that Holy Spirit, you'll be strong and let them ponder the word that was spoken. Bless them going in. Bless them coming out. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, remember we walk by? Not by? That's right. Not this sight. That sight. Amen. God bless you. Come down for prayer. Come, make that decision this morning. Glory, show us your